recording on. Good evening. This is MED 210 Anatomy and Physiology. And um, the laboratory schedule is out. Uh, please look at announcements for the laboratory schedule. And if you cannot make uh, the dates for this particular class, so you look up the dates uh, for MED 210, term three for NAX. And since this class tip is typically meeting on a Monday evening, um, the laboratory would be on a Monday evening. But again, uh, if you look at the announcements, if you cannot make any of the meetings, please shoot an email. Well, you're gonna have to shoot an email to me to confirm uh, that you are coming to the laboratory because we have to prepare uh, the laboratory for a certain amount of people. So it will be, uh, it will be like by reservation uh, only. So if you do not contact me, there will not be a space for you. And also there are also specific instructions on what to do when you're on campus um, because we have to adhere to the CDC guidelines of social distancing and also um, all intents and purposes when we're going to be doing the dissections we're going to be doing surgery uh, we're going to be washing up as if we're going to uh, scrub in uh, surgery you'll be wearing um, your uh, lab coats and or uh, scrubs if you have we'll be wearing gloves and we'll be masking up and we'll be doing it before uh, the laboratory and after the laboratory. And so there's, it, there's a little bit of a production and that's why we need uh, to be confirmed uh, that you're coming. And if you can't come, uh, I can group uh, um, a small groups of students together. Um, I already have a small group of students uh, coming in on Saturdays at 10 a.m. So if you can't make that Monday evening uh, on the dates that are on that document, on the, on the announcements, then please inform me. Um, the second uh, public service announcement is registration starts, uh, I think somewhere, it's supposed to start this week, but um, I was trying to help some people register for class and um, it doesn't seem like the term four schedule is, uh, is, is officially up yet, but I can help guide you on not only physically on how to register, but also um, on what classes, especially if you're a BS health science student uh, with uh, future plans of uh, applying to the School of Nursing. And part of that uh, conversation is also how far along are you in your, um, in your application. Uh, my professional opinion is get your application into the School of Nursing as soon as possible, even though you, uh, you haven't finished all your prerequisites. Okay, because the quicker you get into their program, uh, you know, the quicker you're on their list and then you, you'll have nursing advisors instead of me, right? Because remember, my, uh, my goal uh, as a health sciences advisor is to properly transition you into uh, the School of Nursing uh, for those of you who are interested. So with that being said, what, are we do what is due this week? Of course, all uh, week four items, which is task four, lesson four, and discussion four. And those of you who had discussions and got scored, had points taken away, please look at the comments and then uh, reply to the comments so I can award you full credit. So if you're missing a citation or your citation's a little off and I took a couple of points off, uh, fix it. And then once you fix it, right, I can award you full credit. So this week and next week, there's no midterm for this exam, but midterm grades are due this weekend by Saturday. So uh, please try to do um, uh, at least your, uh, your task um, and uh, maybe your discussion uh, by Saturday uh, so um, your grade can be a little bit more robust. But typically your midterm grade is just, um, it's not an official grade. It is simply where are you along in the course? If this was on the ground, you would be having a midterm at this time. But uh, since we're doing hybrid and uh, we're not on the ground, um, um, there's no midterm and we just simply do uh, task five, lesson five and discussion five as if uh, you know, uh, uh, it was a normal week. And of course, culminating in a final online exam in week 10, but you should be available and have access by week nine. So, this week and next week, we're going to be talking about the uh, uh, musculoskeletal system, uh, movement, and uh, uh, stability. And we'll be talking about um, muscles first, 
and the uh, Masio system. And there's some nice videos here. And I wanted to show, is it here? Uh, and don't worry about the ATP Muscle Lab. Uh, again, uh, if you look at the document and announcements regarding laboratories, it outlines what exactly uh, we'll be doing in laboratory. And we're not going to be doing this uh, um, ATP uh, Muscle Lab. So what are the main points for this week, especially so that you can uh, submit your task? The structure of the muscular system, how do you actually move, and uh, how does your muscles actually contract? So those are, those are the three main things. So let's look at the first one, um, the actual structure of the muscular system. And you'll see here this particular, um, uh, what do you call it? This particular video was uh, repeated twice. So. Let's do something that we haven't done for this particular class yet. Let's look at, um, oh, I have to go back into Anatomy Physiology 1. And they're looking at uh, their chapter 11. And if you don't, if you didn't have Anatomy Physiology 1 and you didn't have your, your textbook, just look at, look. Uh, open up openstacks.org and and then you write down uh, anatomy and physiology and uh, you should uh, once you have that it'll bring you to this page and then you go to the table of contents and I believe it was chapter 11 Make my life a little easier Okay, so you can go into openstacks.org and it's all intents and purposes is a textbook. So we look at it here, okay? We look at our objectives. What's an agonist? What's an antagonist? Organization of the muscle fascicles or, you know, a more microscopic uh, uh, look at the muscle. Uh, then um, how do you name muscles? And uh, that's a little bit of review of your medical terminology and um, actions of the muscles and uh, also the origins insertions. Now for future training for here, for this particular class, you don't need to memorize the origins insertions, but for future training, you most definitely will. And now we're going to talk about all these things. So let's look at... Um, What's an agonist? What's an antagonist? Well, all that the body does all day, muscle-wise, is shrink or contract. That's all a muscle does. It has to get shorter. So if we look at this bicep here, and the movement here uh, is called flexion. So these biceps, or bi, meaning two, two heads, will do what? They'll shorten. And then you can bring this glass up, raise this glass up. And what will it do to the angle here? It will decrease the angle, hence the term is called flexion. Now, the mean, the prime mover, is this bicep. And that's also the agonist. It's the, it's the main muscle that's going to be doing the work. But you're going to also have help. And that's a synergist. And the synergist here is your uh, brachioradialis. So if you look at the biceps brachii, brachii meaning upper arm, biceps means bi, two, sep means head. So there's two heads here, right? So you, go, you also have this synergist muscle, your brachioradialis, brachio, which is a, a part of your upper arm, and it's connected to your radial bone, it's hence the term brachioradialis. So prime mover or agonist, right? If you hurt your bicep, would you be able to move it? You won't be able to flex your arm. And same likewise here, if you hurt your brachioradialis, it goes, you'd be able to lift up your arm, but it won't be as efficient. And if anyone has ever been to the gym, you know when you do bicep curls, right? Especially if you do them too much, you're going to feel it here. And also, you're going to feel it there as well. Now, 
the one thing about muscles is if you have an agonist, you will also have an antagonist. So the agonist and the synergist, they have to be contracting. They have to be getting smaller. But your, bi your triceps, which is on the other side of your upper arm, that has to relax. And that's the antagonist. So the agonist, right, the prime mover, that is going to contract. And the antagonist, which is your triceps brachii, which is uh, behind this, that has to relax. And that's everything in your body. When one side of your body is contracting, the other side has to relax and vice versa. Because if I want to flex my arm, right? That's flexion, that what we just talked about. If I want to extend my arm, now my biceps and brachioradialis have to relax. And then now my triceps will contract so that the arm will move the other way. Okay, so those are, uh, Go, those are antagon, go, those are agonists, antagonists, and synergists. These are common uh, names. Now, insertion versus origin. Every muscle has one part where it moves a lot and another part where it doesn't move too much. So when you look at your biceps, right, you're going to see one part here, right, that's connecting into... Uh, your lower arm, that's going to move a lot. But this part up here isn't going to move too much. So it goes, the more stabilized part, like your shoulder, that's your origin. And the more flexible or the part that's going to move more is your insertion. Now, this is important to know because um, uh, which part would most likely be damaged upon movement? It would be the insertion. It would be the thing that's moving a lot. And in this case, it would be this part right here. Okay. And here, because they have uh, the word version of that picture that we just, uh, uh, just shown. Okay. Now, if we look at this and let's enlarge this. A lot of the muscles have medical terminology names, if not all of them. And if you look at the names, it gives away what it is. So you could sit and try to memorize all the muscles, which wouldn't be a smart idea. Or you could look at the names and see goes, if you can use your medical terminology powers to make it make sense. For example, if you're looking at the face, an orb is something that's round. So your orbicularis oris has to be the, the round or surrounding circular muscle around the mouth. You also have your orbicularis oculi. That has to be the circular muscles around your eye. You also have um, um, some muscles that are in the shape of things. So your deltoid muscle or your shoulder muscle, if you use your imagination a little bit, there's one side here, there's another side here, and there's another side here, creating a triangle. And um, the Greek symbol for uh, you know a triangle uh, is delta, hence the term deltoid. It looks like a triangle. It looks like a delta. Now we already talked about biceps brachii. Sep means head or belly. So if I have biceps, I have how many? I got two of them. And on the other side of my arm, I had triceps. Therefore, that has three bellies or three heads. And in my thigh, I have quadriceps. So that has to be four heads. Another um, uh, term uh, that's good is rectus. Rectus is a term for any uh, for a set of straight muscles. So your rectus femoris has to be the straight muscle going up and down. You have here, you see this guy's eight pack. He has, or she has, rectus abdominis. And you have here, this is another direction. These are your external obliques. And then up here, we're going to talk about uh, your serratus, which they look like a serrated knife. So, uh, you know, there's little riblets here that bodybuilders have and really thin people. Um, that's called your serratus, kind of like a serrated knife 
or kind of like a bunch of little knives. Um, you also have muscles that are major, like your pectoralis or your pecs, right? You have your pec major. And then if I cut all this out, there's another one underneath it, and that's your pectoralis mi a minor. Same thing, maybe you've heard about uh, the muscles in your, uh, your butt. You have your gluteus major, gluteus medius, and gluteus minimus. So you have your gluteus maximus, that's the big muscle uh, uh, that's in your butt. And then you have two smaller ones, medius and minimus, which are uh, underneath. And your gluteus maximus, uh, the main thing that uh, that does is help you walk. And your pectoralis major, the main thing that this does is to help uh, lift and push your arms. Uh, sartorius, I always think sartorius as uh, this parallel. And to me, I see sartorius, I think sideways. And there's a parallel uh, uh, muscle that goes this way, if you could see here. And that's your sartorius. And that's not so, such a good one to remember. But the other ones, brachii, upper arm, femoris, or your femur, your thigh, rectus, straight, deltoid is a shape. You also have your trapezius, which is another shape. And you have your rhomboid muscles or your rhomboidus, which is in the back. Uh, that looks like in the shape of the rhomboid. So that too. So when, you're, when it's start time to... Um, memorize all these muscles and I'll have uh, some worksheets and your announcements uh, to get you going on some of the major uh, muscles of your face, your abdomen, your torso and your legs uh, that you can start on. Uh, also, you can look at your medical terminology textbook as well. They have a lot of nice things. And you can see here, this person's flexing. So the bicep is going to get shorter, but back here, the tricep has to do what? It has to relax because when you're flexing the muscle, right, like this person is doing here, this has to get shorter and this one has to get longer. When you're flexing, this biceps brachii is contracting and getting smaller. And this is the agonist. This is the main mover. But the antagonist is here, your triceps brachii. Your biceps has two heads and your triceps has three. All right, divergent, divergent. Oh, let's make it a little smaller. Well, not that small. So let's go to now, now that you have a little idea on how, uh, uh, how the muscles are termed, let's look, at, let's look at some of the muscle names. And here's a nice page with, and again, you could use your medical terminology powers. Your occipital frontalis, right? Your occiput, right, is the front sides of your head. And of course, it is the front. Therefore, it's the occipital frontalis. Sternocleidomastoid, it connects to your sternum. Clido, which is your, um, um, what do you call this? Your collarbone and your mastoid process here uh, uh, in your neck. So it's a muscle that'll go one, two, and three. So there'll be three parts. Deltoid we went over, pec major, rectus abdominis, uh, pec minor. Do you see the serratus? Remember those little riblets? I call them riblets, but you know how it lo looks like, kind of like a, a serrated edge on a knife? Brachialis, of course, that's the upper arm that's right next to the biceps brachii your brachioradialis. Now, there are some muscles that are also named after what they do. Like your pronator teres helps you pronate your hand. And that's when you, you know, when you turn your hand to put your hand, your palm side down on a desk, that's pronator. Everything here uh, um, on the volar surface of your arm, when you have your arms out, those have to be, um, um, these are fascia. Those have to be flexors. Carpi means fingers, right? And of course, on your radial bone. So these are all your flexor carpi radialis. If you have any damage to any of your flexors, can you make a fist? Nope. 
because you have to be able to flex and close your hand to make a fist. Now you have extensors on the other side. If I cut the extensor on the other side, then you won't be able to uh, open up your hand, right? Uh, rectus femoris, iliopsoas, it connects us to your ilium, so which is part of your, um, uh, what do you call that, pelvic girdle. Uh, gracilis, vastus, vastus means big, and your vastus medialis, vastus lateralis, right? Um, they're part of your quadriceps because they're vast, they're big, and they have to be big. Um, uh, they're the uh, largest uh, set of muscles covering uh, your largest bone in your body, which is your uh, femur. Um, oh, remember we talked about your uh, rhomboid? It's a, like a, it's like a, like a, um, what's the best word? Well, instead of me trying to explain what it is, if you remember what a rhombus is, right? It looks like that. Kind of like a, um, a rectangle uh, squished to one side. Doesn't this look like a rectangle squished to one side? And a trapezoid. Kind of looks like this. That's a better one. Better image. Yeah, it looks like this. Well, you see that? These are your traps. It goes like this way, right? This is the, your traps are what make part of, you know, if you've seen a, mid, a really large middle linebacker, uh, they have no neck, uh, people who play football, American football, okay? Anterior versus posterior, oblique, okay? If you have biceps brachia, brachialis, you also have your biceps femoris, which are on the back part. Okay, and uh, with the, with, and again, you have your extensors, they're on the back side, and that makes sense because if I'm going to extend, I'm going to uh, contract all the stuff in my posterior. And if I'm uh, flexing, those are the things in the front. And remember, if I'm flexing, these extensors have to be relaxed. But you could also see that if I damaged any of the extensors, I won't be able to extend my arm or my leg. If I damage the flexors, I won't be able to flex my arm or flex my leg. Okay. Oh, we have things abductors. Now let's look at that abduction as a nice uh, quick review of movement. If you recall your medical terminology, abduction means Ab means away. So abduction is moving your arms away from midline. And the exact opposite is adduction is your uh, body's capability of adding towards the midline. That's a nice little, quick little review of uh, medical terminology. And of course you have abductor digiti minimi. So it means what? It's going to take away from midline, what? Digit or your phalanges or your fingers. And which one? The little one, the mini one. Okay, so that's, those are some ways, and here's some ways to utilize uh, medical terminology to remember, uh, remember all of these muscles. Okay, and uh, we went over uh, uni, bi, tri, quad, things that are external, things that are internal, things that are big, maximus, things that are small, minimus. Another word for uh, um, long and short is longus and brevis. Okay. We already went through oblique. All right. Here's some muscles of the face. Look at that a little bit. We already went over occipital frontalis. It's connection with my frontal part and the occipital part uh, of my skull, right? You all, we already talked about the orbicularis oculi with my eyes. Nasalis has to be the one near my nasal, my bone. You have your 
orbicularis oris, which is around your mouth. You also have one right here on the side of your mouth. That's your buccinator, right? It uh, helps you chew. You also have muscles of mastication, which include the buccinator. You can look those up as well. And the buccinator is a uh, part of your cheek. Now, if you look at this, one of these days, you're gonna have to be able to memorize your origin and insertion, and, uh, but not, not for this class, but for uh, uh, maybe a, a, a future class, or if you're planning to get into uh, more specific anatomy and physiology. But um, just this gives you an idea, what's in the front, what's in the back, and what's the prime mover, and kind of what does it do? You don't really need to know origin insertion. All you need to know for this particular course is that origin is the part of the muscle that doesn't move too much. Insertion is the part of the muscle that's gonna have greater movement and also clinically um, a greater propensity towards damage. You also have muscles that move your eyes, right? Uh, controlled by your cranial nerve three, four and six. And this is the reason why the doctor does that pen light test because we want to check out the different muscles. Lateral rectus, lateral means to the side, medial means to the, towards the middle. So we're looking at my patient's right eye here, right? And then you have your uh, superior and inferior rectus, and rectus means straight, right? You also have your obliques. So you could pretty much figure out which one's which, depending on what will it do. Lateral rectus, we'll pull it laterally or to the side. Medial rectus, we'll pull your eyeball towards the, uh, the nose or the medial part. You have your uh, obliques, okay, which make things go um, diagonal. And then you have your superior and inferior. Of course, superior goes up, inferior goes down. And that's a common thing that we look at. The masseter, I just mentioned the buccinator earlier, which is right here. And then you have the max masseter right here. These are part of uh, muscles of mastication that help move your lower jaw. That's why if you like, you know, on game day, you're eating way too much Doritos. You ever have this lock up on you? Yeah, happens. Okay. These are nice. And of course, tongue is also a muscle, but is also a sensory. So you could see how it's uh, connected to glossal muscles, hypoglossus, and glossal means tongue. So you have the genial, hypo, hyo, and stylo. And just know that the tongue is not only you, uh, utilized for uh, speech and uh, uh, voluntary movement, this is also a sensory organ, which we will go over uh, later, uh, later in the term. Uh, anterior neck, or the dangerous triangle of the neck. Nice to know, right? Uh, but the one, the sternocleidomastoid, if they have it here. No, they don't. Oh, here it is, right? Remember, connects to the sternum, connects to, uh, uh, the mastoid process right here. Uh, well, it's a little bit on back closer to your ear, but underneath here. And uh, of course, connects it to your uh, sternum, your clido, which is your clavicle, and back here, mastoid process. Hence the term sternocleidomastoid. And it's the major muscle that helps you turn your neck. Let's see your SCM here. Okay. So one of these days, all of this stuff you should have to memorize. But for right now, just get a general feel and, um, and also a general understanding that how muscles work and how there's a give and take. And uh, there's several views and uh, several angles here. They're nice and you could see it's very, very comprehensive. And you could use any other text as well. I wanna to try to get to 
some of the muscles of the abdomen. Here you go. Of course, you have your pec major. Now, your latissimus dorsi, you know those wings that come? Lat, or if you have latitude, that means it's wide. And your dorsum, which is your back. So that's the one where it gives the V taper, you know, in bodybuilders. And these are those riblets that I was talking about, the anterior serratus uh, muscles. Doesn't it look like a serrated knife? You know, like a, a bread knife that's like that. And those are your serratus. And these are people who have less than 3% body fat who have these lovely, lovely things here. I always make the joke that I have an, I have an eight pack, but it's, under, it's underneath a good 60 pounds of fat. You also have your external obliques. And if, if you have an external oblique, there has to be an internal oblique. And that helps you move your torso from side to side. Uh, linea alba, and in medical terms, it's called the white line. And that's the, uh, that's the midline. Right? And of course, you have your rectus abdominis, which is your eight pack or your six pack. And that's the, the straight muscles that are going straight up and down. Okay, here are some um, uh, nice hip, uh, hip muscles. So if you damage any of this part, you have your ilium here and uh, your sacral bones down here. Okay, and your psoas major is a major muscle system here uh, for your pelvic girdle. And again, um, if I didn't mention it early, the major part of muscles is um, not only for movement, but also for st uh, stability and protection of your skeletal system and your skeletal system vice versa. Thorax, oh, let's talk about the diaphragm. Now, that's a weird angle of the diaphragm and uh, your intercostal muscles, which help you breathe. Let's look at another picture of the diaphragm and what's its purpose. This is a better way to looking, uh, of looking at it. Now, picture your lungs like a set of bellows or like, um, uh, like, like a syringe. And when you pull down a plunger on the syringe, just like the way you inhale, your diaphragm helps create a negative pressure in your lungs so that air can go in. And that is a major muscle of uh, respiration as, uh, that goes along with your intercostal muscles, inter, in between, cost, your ribs, that help draw your, um, your, um, your chest, uh, your rib cage up and out. So uh, everyone take a moment and Inhale. Do you notice when you inhale, the bottom of your abdomen drops out? And then if you look at your rib cage, it's going up and out. It's all because of these muscles are creating a negative pressure so that the air can go in so you can inhale. And you can now see how important muscles are, especially if you had something like myasthenia gravis, which has progressive muscle weakness. So uh, you could easily see if those muscles weren't working, you won't be able to breathe very well by the end of the day. Um, uh, pelvic floor muscles, nice to know. Uh, you'll get to know them in greater detail when you're, uh, especially uh, when you're talking about obstetrics and genital urinary issues. It's nice to know. your pectoral girdle. Now your pectoral girdle is uh, anything that deals with your chest and anything that connects to your, um, um, uh, your, you know, your shoulders and your shoulder blades and your upper arm. And they call that the pectoral girdle because all of these muscles here uh, um, uh, kind of like stabilize that part of your body. Again, nice to know. And just like any encyclopedia, it has every little thing on every little thing. You saw other views of this. I want to get down to here, arms and fingers. I want to get, what I want to get down to is the next process, which is what does a muscle actually look like? What does a muscle fascicle look like?
because all of this is academic. You can all read all of these and you eventually have to memorize them all. But let's talk about physiology. I'm trying to get to that part, which is our next goal. Oh, you're not going to show it. So let's go find it. Let me take this, get rid of this. This will close down. And let me show you a picture of your typical muscle fascicle. Let's find a good one. Here you go. So if you've eaten chicken, I had some Popeyes this afternoon, and if you uh, take apart a drumstick, you'll see that there's like extra skin, and then everything's like threads. And just like when you make a rope, one single thread, it's easy to rip. But if I braid a whole bunch of threads together, then braid those together, then cover those and braid some more, you're gonna have a pretty thick rope and you're gonna have a very strong rope. So that's what this is. So you start off with the, um, uh, with the myofibril, the actual fiber, okay? And then it gets covered, you get a whole bunch of them together and it gets covered with this covering called the sarcolemma. Then you put a whole bunch of these sarcolemmas together then you create and cover it with an endomesium, you get a fascicle. You put a whole bunch of fascicles together, each one covered by its own paramecium, and then a final outer covering of epimesium. And of course, muscle also has to have uh, an artery, which is in red, a vein, blue, and it's missing uh, yellow, which is a nerve. Because a nerve has to be able to tell this when to contract. And of course, all of these things, if you notice, all of these skins or coverings come together in this connective tissue called a tendon. And your tendon is something that connects your muscle to a bone. So if you have tendonitis, this is the problem. Are you able to move around in tendonitis? No. Will it be painful? Yes. Remember, you have uh, veins here, right? If you have a disease of the muscle, there's arteries and veins and nerves right, especially the artery and veins, don't you think they, they're, they're, they're going into this as well? So you could easily have uh, um, um, damage coming from here, going to here, whether it be inflammation or cancer or uh, other pathologies. So if you look at that, that's where your muscle gets strength. It's like a braid of a braid of a covering of a braid of another covering, and that's where it gets strength. And a little side note, sprain versus strain. If any of you uh, haven't had your uh, clinical stuff yet, sprain versus strain, you're going to still have the same joint problem. You're still not going to be able to move around. Clinically, they look the same, but a strain is a stretch of a tendon. An overstretching of this, right, through some um, exercise, or maybe you bent it the wrong way, you, you bent that joint the wrong way, and uh, then you get... Um, uh, some form of uh, traumatic tendonitis, which is a strain. Now, a sprain is an overstretching of a ligament. And a ligament is the same connective tissue, but ligaments connect bone to bone. Tendons connect muscles to bone. Now, how does this thing actually contract and get smaller? Well, actually, this thing, the myofibril. So if the myofibril gets smaller, this will get smaller, this, this, all of these, and then uh, that's when you have uh, contraction. So let's look at that. Here you go. Why won't it let me, oh, there you go. If you see all the myofibrils, they're actually all of these little proteins that overlap each other. And uh, let's, and the two proteins in question are actin and myosin. Now you can see how they're interlaced and how their spaces. And let me show you a nice video if we can find it. I don't like the video. Um, 
um, on your, you know, the one on lesson five, it looks like it was made by claymation and I don't like it. So uh, let's look at this video. There's a better one. And I'll have the link uh, in the notes or you could look at the link uh, that I did here. Ooh, is this the Khan Academy one or was it this one? Well, well, we'll try this one, it's shorter. You use muscles every day to do activities. This woman is using muscles to breathe, circulate blood, and move her hand to take notes. Your cardiac and smooth muscle tissues are involuntary. You do not consciously control their actions. Skeletal muscle works under voluntary control. Skeletal muscles are composed of bundles of muscle fibers. Muscle fibers are long cylindrical cells containing several nuclei. Muscles will contract or relax when they receive signals from the nervous system. A neuromuscular junction is the site of the signal exchange. This is where the synaptic bulb of an axon terminal and muscle fiber connect. Muscle fibers are composed of many myofibrils. A myofibril contains contractile units called sarcomeres. Sarcomeres run adjacent to one another down the length of the myofibril. Each sarcomere consists of alternating thick and thin protein filaments, giving skeletal muscle its striated appearance. The muscle contracts when these filaments slide past each other. The thick filaments are myosin, which are anchored at the center of the sarcomere, called the M-line. The thin filaments are composed of the protein actin, which are anchored to the Z-lines on the outer edges of the sarcomere. Because the actin filaments are anchored to the Z-lines, the sarcomere shortens from both sides when actin filaments slide along the myosin filaments. Although the action between the filaments is described as sliding, the myosin filament actually pulls the actin along its length. The cross bridges of the myosin filaments attach to the actin filaments and exert force on them to move. This action is known as the sliding filament mechanism of muscle contraction. In this model, the sarcomeres shorten without the thick or thin filaments changing in length. A contraction begins when a bound ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate. This causes the myosin head to extend and can attach to a binding site on actin, forming a cross bridge. An action called the power stroke is triggered, allowing myosin to pull the actin filament toward the M line, thereby shortening the sarcomere. ADP and inorganic. All right, let's uh, go back because this is where uh, we have to make some connections to anatomy and physiology one. Now, if you recall ATP, ATP was created in cells uh, in your mitochondria. ATP is uh, adenosine triphosphate, and when it gets hydrolyzed or broken down into ADP, adenosine diphosphate, or AMP, adenosine monophosphate, it releases energy. And that's the reason why we're constantly eating, so we can convert everything to glucose, which is a fuel, and we're constantly breathing, so uh, uh, we're taking in oxygen. So the glucose and oxygen, that's the fuel to make the ATP. And then the ATP binds on this myosin thick filament, and that's what helps this power stroke. And that's why uh, you know, it's not good to work out when you're... Uh, uh, when you don't have any energy in you. It's also not good to work out without breathing. If ever you see anybody lifting a heavy weight, they try to hold their breath, not a very good idea. Um, because you can now see, I need glucose and oxygen to create this ATP, and I need it uh, to pull these thin filaments, actin, uh, and it's from this thick filament, myosin. And all these things are, if you look at it, they're just bubbles little bubbles all connected together, all they are is proteins, a bunch of amino acids formed in a specific sequence from our DNA, and that's all that muscle is. So now you know exactly how your muscles actually shrink. And let's go back to this thing right here, where they talked about 
this part right here. Neuron is a nerve cell. So this is called a, a motor neuron because your brain has to send an electrical signal to the neuron, the nerve cell, and then it releases um, uh, chemicals called neurotransmitters that will then uh, tell the muscle what to do. And in the beginning, they talked about three different types of uh, muscles, smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle has those striations because of the M and Z line of the actin and myosin uh, filaments, actin and myosin proteins, so they're called striated muscles. These muscles, of course, as you can see this young lady, she's able to write down what she's thinking and write down what she's hearing. These are striated muscle is voluntary, right? If I wanna raise my hand, I think about it, and the, the motor neuron from the brain sends the message down, and then I raise my hand. Now, smooth muscle and cardiac muscle are involuntary. Your smooth muscle is also called visceral muscle, right? So viscera are your guts. So when you eat a ham sandwich, are you really controlling uh, that bolus of food going down your throat and, and going around your stomach? Can you really control all the sounds that your stomach and intestines make? You can't. Um, same thing with blood pressure. Um, the smooth muscle, the smooth muscle lining all of your arteries, that controls your blood pressure. So because you can't tell yourself, hey, blood pressure, go down, or hey, blood pressure, go up. It doesn't, doesn't work that way. Um, so it's involuntary. And the same thing with cardiac muscle. If you're afraid, no matter uh, how you keep on telling yourself, I'm not afraid, I'm not afraid, your heart rate is going to go up. Your blood pressure is going to go up. Okay. And there's a whole bunch of things that will uh, uh, react. If you recall your um, parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems, right? And they, they're intrinsically related to both smooth muscle and cardiac muscle, part of your involuntary. So in parasympathetic, in a fight or flight situation, do you have any real control over your smooth muscle and cardiac muscle? No, you do not. And same thing with parasympathetic as well. So... Let's go back to this. Where were we? Here we go. Now we were back to this myosin thick filament, right? Uh, was now uh, pulling on the actin, the thin filament, because it now has power from adenosine triphosphate, which is metabolic fuel that we get from breathing, oxygen, and of course, uh, uh, food from uh, the glucose from the food we ate. ADP and inorganic phosphate are released during the power stroke. The myosin remains attached to actin until a new molecule of ATP binds, freeing the myosin to either go through another cycle of binding and more contraction or remain unattached to allow the muscle to relax. Muscle contractions are controlled by the actions of calcium. The thin actin filaments are associated with regulatory proteins called troponin and tropomyosin. When a muscle is relaxed, tropomyosin blocks the cross-bridge binding sites on actin. When calcium ion levels are high enough and ATP is present, calcium ions bind to the troponin, which displaces tropomyosin, exposing the myosin binding sites on actin. This allows myosin to attach to a binding site on actin forming a cross bridge. Now, uh, if you know anything about a calcium push, uh, that is going to um, um, uh, facilitate uh, contraction. And actually we use calcium in uh, cardiovascular uh, pharmacology to help promote contractility of the heart. And it makes sense, right? So you could see here how our knowledge of anatomy and physiology helps us in pharmacology, helps us in uh, utilizing it for clinical purposes. Calcium ions are stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum and are released in response to signals from the nervous system to contract. Neurotransmitter molecules are released from a neuron and bind to receptors, which depolarizes the membrane of the muscle fiber. The electrical impulse travels down the T-tubules and opens calcium stores. Calcium ions flow to the myofibrils, 
where they trigger a muscle contraction. As the actin and myosin slide along each other, the entire sarcomere shortens as the Z lines draw closer to the M line. As the sarcomeres in myofibrils contract, the entire muscle fiber will shorten. So you could see there that that's all that contraction is, is uh, just the shortening of these thick myosin and thin actin uh, uh, proteins, which they're all connected and, uh, and um, they're controlled via um, your motor neuron, which is uh, the nerve cell. So that same motor neuron, uh, it begs the question, then how do I pick up an egg and, and still have the same capability of, uh, you know, picking up a, you know, a 40 pound weight? Well, your brain will, uh, will tell certain numbers of fibers, right, uh, to move. And um, that's how you're able to pick up an egg uh, and only use uh, several uh, myofibrils when you want to gently pick up an egg. And then there's something called recruitment where you get more fibers and more muscles uh, that band together to, um, uh, to, uh, to pick up something or to move something much, much heavier. So that's a nice uh, YouTube video. It's muscle contraction process, HD animation. It's a nice one, uh, and it and it and it touched a. It's better. It's better than the one in your lesson. I don't like the one in your lesson, and it's on it's just YouTube. And uh, let's see here. And you could pause the video, and you could find it here at uh, this address. So you could pause the video and then uh, copy and paste it if you want to watch the video again, because this video has a chock full of stuff got a ton of stuff. So let's go over uh, one, two, three, four, five. Let's go over, did we go over the things that we need to go over? Right? Oopsies, I'm in the wrong one. Let me be 210. And that's actually how you study. You have to ask yourself, what are my objectives and did I go through all of them? Because I think I skipped something. Well, let's look if I skipped something. Uh, did we talk about ATP and muscle movement? Yes. Did we talk about the structure of the muscular system? Um, um, also how to name muscles, how exactly the muscles contract and the physiology of movement? Yes, we did. So we went through all of that. And the one other thing that, um, that the video mentioned that I also want to discuss is, maybe you've heard of this before, depolarization, right? Let's look at what that means. Now, what I like talking about depolarization is, you got to think about something like this. You have to think about like uh, cells and the insides and the outsides of cells and the extracellular fluid and the intracellular fluid. And this is of course your bilipid layer. And then you have channels here, right? And you have integral proteins and you're gonna have salts, all right? And the salts we already know have pluses and minuses. Now, just like a car battery, if you've ever, if you've ever watched uh, the movie, The Matrix, when they talk about, oh, all humans are, are batteries. Well, we are, we have a lot of electric, a decent amount of electricity running through us. And when you think about it, when you look at the car battery, there's a plus and there's a minus. So if you only touch the plus side, you won't get electrocuted. If you only touch the negative side, you, only will, you won't get electrocuted. But if you complete the circuit, the plus and minus together, right? then you're gonna get zapped, then you're gonna get electricity. So if you see here, if I keep all the pluses and minuses separate, and I could do that via these protein channel pumps, will there be any electricity? So that will be what? Polarized. So if there's polarized, the pluses and minuses aren't together, right? So that there won't be any, electric won't be any electricity here in this synaptic bulb of this neuron. This is a, a nerve cell. So of course, what are my millivolts? Nothing. 
But what happens when I start moving the pluses and minuses, if you see this uh, uh, sodium, right, was the pluses, what if I start moving the pluses and minuses towards each other through these channels? What will happen, right? We know, know what happens in electricity. The pluses and minuses go together. That means they are depolarized, not separated or not polar. So the pluses and minuses are now together. And what will happen, especially with sodium? You'll have depolarization or there'll be some electricity. And then when you repolarize, uh, you flush the system now with potassium. And now that tells, that tells the pluses and minuses to do what? get on opposite sides of the fence, okay? So depolarization, I want you to think of depolarization as doing work. The pluses and minuses are getting together, I'm gonna to get some electricity. And repolarization is when the pluses and minuses now go to the respective corners or go to the respective side of the fence. They're not meeting, and if they're not meeting, they're recharging for the next depolarization. So think depolarization, doing work. Repolarization is when you're recharging. And you'll need this understanding when you uh, learn about your, uh, uh, how EKGs work. And you can see here, this kind of looks like an EKG, right? Where there's depolarization. Let's look at this. Depolarization, so electricity will go up in millivolts, right? And repolarization, I'm going to recharge and then get ready for the next a muscle contraction and isn't that how the heart beats first you have boop and then it recharges and then you have another one and uh, you will see this and learn this again uh, in your um, um, when you start learning about EKG and stuff like that so the task for this week uh, get like three these three concepts and try to uh, 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 link them together in a concept map. Please uh, submit um, like whether uh, uh, an actual file, please don't just copy and paste it um, onto the submission because it takes up a, lot, a ton of space. Oh, why do I keep on hitting that button? Now let's uh, give you a hint on discussion five, of course, 200 words uh, at least. And also, some of you write really well. Uh, don't do a thousand words, please. Don't do nine hundred words. Uh, but uh, you know, two hundred to four hundred will suffice. But some of you are really uh, into your writing, and but make sure it has an APA uh, cited uh, format. And if you still don't know or don't understand how that is, please give me a, give a call to me so or an email to me so I can send you my homegrown video. So, chronic fatigue syndrome. So what is it, what can it, what it do, and related to what you learned today, okay? Unexplained muscle pain, and also talk about how the therapies actually attack the pathophysiology. So the first thing you have to do is tell me what it is, what's the pathophysiology, and how does the current research on uh, therapies support uh, safe and effective uh, management? Because what we're really doing is uh, in healthcare, we're not curing anybody. We are managing people's health and we're pushing the body towards normal, towards the middle. And in chronic fatigue syndrome, it's abnormal. And chronic is, uh, that means this thing's gonna be progressive. It's gonna take some time, right? Which is not good. And we don't like things that will bother our patient for long periods of time. So we would like to attack things like that. So a uh, pretty straightforward discussion for, uh, for this week. And again, uh, I'll cal you, calculate your grade as is, but uh, the, the more you can get done by, for week five, uh, by the weekend, um, uh, it'll bolster your grade. But again, if you can't get to it, of course, for attendance purposes, get, get to something, either the task, the session, or the lesson. Now, what's lesson five? Let's look at it. See, this is the video I was talking about. This video doesn't even work, but this video, ugh, awful. And it's like claymation, I don't know. Uh, when, the, um, uh, when the curriculum committee votes on this, I am voting to uh, bury this out to sea somewhere. I really don't like that video. 
So let's look at the case study. I click on it, download, and I have one or two students that have issues downloading this PDF. Uh, if that's so, shoot me an email. I'll, 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 I'll save it on mine as PDF, and then I'll get it to you. So of course, read part one. Answers questions one, two, three, four, five, six. Read part two and answers seven through 13. That's it. Part one, part two, 13 questions. And that is it for this particular case. Okay. So if anyone has any questions, comments, recipes, and of course, even though we're not really uh, gonna ask you, oh, what's this muscle? What's that muscle? You should start learning all of those muscles and all of those in all of those diagrams and uh, start looking at origins and insertions, start memorizing them now. Because, uh, and it's also the same thing for those of you uh, who aren't even in pharmacology yet or just taking your pharmacology class, start memorizing all those drugs and their generic and their mechanism action. Uh, start doing things now. And not because it's gonna be on any test, because one day you're gonna be in the ward and someone's gonna ask you something and you won't know it, and then they'll find somebody else, okay? So with that being said, anyone have any uh, questions, comments, or recipes? If not, um, please. I have a quick question, Dr. Garayas. Um, can you go over, um, can you remind me of everything we're supposed to do for lesson four? Oh, for lesson four, I can go back Right. Well, let me stop the uh, the recording first.